Hey everyone and welcome back to Sasquatch Theory. Today we have an interesting story from the state of Oklahoma. The guy claims he worked with the Interior of Defense and other government agencies. You know, the stories that I really relate to are the down-to-earth stories where it's just regular people out in the woods experiencing the activity. I will admit, I become kind of skeptical with people's claims when the first thing they mention is they were a cop or they worked for the government and they never actually share something we didn't already know in the end and it seems like they're pulling all this information from other stories and other channels that they've heard. I feel like I've had a small percentage of people that have done that in the past on my channel. They don't really have an eye sighting and you can easily tell they're pulling their information from other big channels and stories that have been told on the internet. They use the same terminology word for word, and I can see right through that. This gentleman also mentioned that he was on Sasquatch Chronicles, and when I asked him to tell me what episode it was so I can go back and watch it, I never got an answer, and he kind of ghosted me. Another red flag with the story is anytime I would ask questions about the things he brought up, he would give me very vague answers and kind of avoid and dodge them. So in the end, I can't really say for sure, and what he describes seems to be accurate with Sasquatch activity. And I can't say for myself that this story is not true, so we need to treat it as if it is, and if it's not, we'll debunk it as time goes on, if that makes sense to people. But I think we need to give it a fair chance, and I can't say for sure because I wasn't in the man's shoes, and I don't know if he's telling the truth or trying to pull one on me, okay? So I wanted that to be known. And I don't want people to think, oh, Miguel just plays anything on his channel and he believes whatever. That's not the case. And I also want to be respectful to the individual because, you know, it's, it's highly disrespectful to disbelieve someone's story if it actually happened. Okay? So, okay. So that's where I'm at with that. No disrespect to anyone. And I'm not being biased to the individual just for the sake of having a YouTube video to put up on my channel. I hope everyone knows that. I almost didn't upload it because I'm very passionate about the subject and I don't like people muddying up the water more than it already is. Okay, so from now on in the future if someone comes to me and claims that they work for the government and they want to tell this big story on my channel, you're going to have to lay it all out from beginning to end and not leave anything out. There's no, oh I can't tell you that or I can't talk about this. If I'm going to risk my reputation on my channel and risk my safety you are too okay so there's no you know you're gonna hide who you are and everything about the story and make all these claims about Sasquatch without actually telling us the whole thing okay so no more of that anyone who's truly passionate about their story and their experience is gonna lay it out all on the line and they're not gonna give a shit about what anyone else thinks similar to the Bob Lazar story you know, you have to tell the truth if it really happened, and if you really believe, you're going to put it out on the line, and you're going to provide some type of evidence. You know, that guy provided his paychecks from the Navy. You know, that says something. So when people hide their identity, it's kind of weird, and they want to make all these claims. All right. With all that being said, let's just get straight into this, and I'll let you guys make up your own minds. Dave, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Thank you. Dave, if you would, tell me a little bit about yourself and your Bigfoot experiences and encounters. Yeah, uh, about me, um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been working, doing government work um, for, oh, off and on for the last like 12 years or so. Um, through my channels, I... Through my well, through my own curiosity, I've always been uh, curious about Bigfoot, and I've spent a little bit of time looking into it um, until I heard about the Humphreys ordeal, about the the one that had been shot down in Octavia, Oklahoma, 
which is about four hours south of where I live. So when most people think of Bigfoot, they think of like the Pacific Northwest or Canada or Yukon or, you know, something like that, or Nepal with like, you know, the Yeti and stuff. But when I heard about this ordeal down in uh, Southeast Oklahoma, I was floored. And the, the evidence around this was astounding. I mean, it was treated as a crime scene. There was blood everywhere, tissue samples, state police involved. Um, I, ta- I called down to the Chamber of Commerce down there and asked him um, about, about the incident. And she, the woman that answered the phone, she told me, she, she didn't know a lot about it, but everybody knows about what happened. But it, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of missing information. And uh, she said, I've got somebody that I can put you in touch with. And lo and behold, it was another federal employee a uh, guy that worked for Homeland Security out of White Wright, Texas. And he knew about the ordeal and the Humphreys incident. And he had a whole bunch more information. And not only that, but he'd been going out on outings with other Homeland Security people to habituation sites that they knew about. I was floored. I, I spent like an hour and a half on the phone with this guy. And uh, I, I just, I was stunned that it finally hit me like, wow, the federal government knows about this and department of interior is part of the cover up. The logging industry is what is what they're protecting. Um, It all fell into place. All the blocks like, man, that makes a lot of sense. And hearing it firsthand from people that were going out and watching them and trying to interact with them. So this was around 2014 when uh, we finally decided to meet up and he was going to take me out with his group uh down in southeastern oklahoma and so i drove down there with a friend of mine mark uh, as to have a witness with me so that i didn't come home telling people about this stuff and they think that i'm you know out of my tree uh having seen or experienced bigfoot or whatever i wanted another witness so we drove down there on a thursday night we planned on staying until sunday night and he, he, he told us to, you know, we would sleep during the day, and then we would be up all night um, going from habituation area to habituation area using um, night vision goggles and other forms of night vision, some rifle scopes that he had, and video, video camera equipment and sound equipment that they set up. And... Uh, you know thursday night we got in and we kind of got our briefing and our first outing was actually on friday night that weekend and it was it was unreal i mean we loaded up in a pickup truck there was like seven of us in the back of a pickup truck and two people driving in the front cab one driving one the passenger we were I don't know, 10 or 11 miles north of Octavia, Oklahoma. This is just north of Beaver Bend Lake. Um, And we were on private land. We were in this big clearing that looked like it was about the size of two football fields, but it was kind of like circular or kind of pear-shaped. And he told us to get out of the truck, and we were going to split up. We needed to be about 50 feet apart, and we were going to walk the perimeter of the tree line in a circle and just keep working it back and forth. And so we spent about an hour walking the tree line and I heard what sounded like, well, I mean, it was bipedal walking, but it was crushing branches and you could hear rocks being compressed and cracking and breaking. And it was clearly something very heavy. And I stopped and I I kind of signaled and whistled over to a guy. I said, "Hey, hey, I think there's something over here. And I got closer to the tree line and I could see a black outline. It was a full moon outside, just clear sky and stars. And I could see a black outline in the, in the, in the woods, but I wasn't seeing like your classic, like hairy ape like creature, but it was a silhouette and its head bobbed down and bobbed back up and then did it a couple more times. And I whistled like, like that and and looked at it and it bobbed its head down again and the most incredible thing happened it 
and this, this is going to sound really bizarre, man. It yelled into my head. It did something telepathic where it was like a screaming yell, but it was like a thought. It was like the thought of yelling in your head as you do it yourself, but quite a bit louder. And it shook me to the core. I couldn't believe it. And I backed up and I grabbed one of the other guys and I said, oh, my, oh my God, what do we, dude, dude, this, there's something here that just spoke to me. And it said like, ooh, 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 and like that, like really loud, but really sharp and really, uh, really crisp, like, ooh, 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 like that. And I, I was frozen, absolutely frozen, but I knew it wasn't audible to anybody else but me. It, I was hearing it in my head. And I, and I knew nobody else could hear it. And of course they didn't. They said, what's going on? Where will you see something? I said, yes, in front of me right here. And I heard the more crushing sounds and that was kind of it. One of the other guys just right after that came back towards the, the, the larger of the group. We kind of started piling down at the end of the clearing. There's about five of us or so starting to group together. Two other guys were up further up the hill in the clearing. And one of them said, here we go, here we go. And he came running back and he had his night vision. He had a rifle scope uh, that had like a battery pack connected to it. So it was kind of an omni scope, not binoculars, but um, just, yeah, just a single scope. And he said, right there, look at the truck. And you could see something standing behind the truck and its head was like three feet above the hard top. And it was tall and skinny. Like it looked like a, like a disformed telephone pole, like standing behind the truck. And he said, they're here. They're all over the place here right now. This is great. You know, and this is what they've been experiencing over and over and over all the time. This was my first time experiencing it. And they passed the rifle scope um, back around uh, to a couple of other guys. And then they gave it back to me. And then I handed it to somebody and they said, what are you talking about? And I looked back and it was gone. But it was long, tall, slender. It was like we were looking at the edge profile of the creature. Whatever, the, whatever they are. I don't know what they are, man. But they're, they're what we saw all that weekend and all night. Well, I'll get to this about what we see and what we don't see. But what we experienced were these shadow creatures. And we have watched them watching us. We filmed them. They were clearly peeking behind trees. They were, you know, they would peek behind a tree and then they would, you could see two sets of legs stretch over and then they would walk and they would jump back behind another large tree and then peek back behind it. You could see part, you know, the shadow of a head and shoulder. And then it would go back behind the tree and hide. And they were, they were more curious about us than we were about, about them. And I didn't feel threatened at all. I felt like that they were just, they wanted to know what we were. And, and they were, they were interested what, what we had to offer or why we were there. I don't know. But it gets even weirder as the weekend goes on. Um, we went to another clearing. We, did, we went down a really, really dark dirt road and we could see more shadow figures like on the sides of the roads like sticking their heads up and then ducking back down and that kind of thing well about three or four in the morning um one, one of the guys who was a really experienced animal call um whistler with his hands you know he could whistle through his thumbs and create you know lots of like deer and owl calling and things like that he started doing owl calling and like like ooh, 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 like that like owl sounds but uh, it was impeccable the way he could do it with his thumbs and whistling through and the, he was cupping his hands and we were getting call signals back and he would do it again and we would we would hear it back. And then he did it once. Last one last time and we heard like 30 owls call back at the same time. I'm going to tell you what, man, Have you ever seen 30 owls at once. They they don't travel in herds or fly in groups like you know uh like crows or grackles or whatever 
uh, they're they're uh, they're total loners, and to have that many owl calls come back all at once was astounding. And we we think that they use animal call as part of their warning systems or the way that they communicate. They also click their teeth. They call it chatter, um, like the 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 smacking of their teeth together, almost like telegraphic, like Morse code. But the clicking sounds of their teeth, uh, I think that's a form of communication they have. They have tons of audio recordings of that stuff. I didn't hear a lot of chatter the whole weekend I was there, but they had recordings they played for me. If they had microphones hidden in tree stumps, they would leave out food, and they could hear them talking, you know, through this whispering kind of thing and then this chatter with their teeth the next night we went back and slept through most of the day i woke up about noon we cooked a bunch of food and talked about all this kind of stuff we did meet a former arson investigator down there who lived in the area we went to his house and and i i had a long talk with him and his wife and I've never seen, rarely do you see in a grown man like in tears over something like this, but he claims that these things have been coming into his garden for years and he's been trying to make contact with them and at one point had a juvenile like literally three feet away from him and he he was trying to shake hands with it and it's, its family was telling it not to get near him. Um, and they were just just absolute bizarre stories of these things and their experiences at night. I I found it highly credible. I just don't think that these people have anything to gain by making all this stuff up. And that many people cannot be crazy for for as many people as I talked to who had had sightings in southeast Oklahoma. It was astounding, absolutely astounding. Saturday night was truly the most epic, wild shit that went on uh, I've ever seen anywhere of anything. We had through, we, we were in a trail, a, a, like a mode pathway through the woods and then some trails that went off in circles and kind of came back to this, to this pathway. And we had what sounded like you know, full size bulls or horses running through the woods, crashing trees, smashing rocks, and absolutely seeing nothing. I saw tree branches fold, snap in half, and um, were utterly destroyed and ripped from ripped from trees. Tree branches, small branches, about the size of your finger, completely ripped from trees in front of me. And having seen no no shadow, nothing at all. And this went on all night. And it, it was just unreal. I don't know how these things are invisible, but we could see clearly, clearly with the full moon, trees being completely ruptured and branches and the sound of the ground being crushed and rocks being crushed and broken with with nothing there it was absolutely bizarre um this this went on late into the night um my friend mark had heard something inside of a bush and he was walking towards it and the entire bush began swaying back and forth violently like left and right and he jumped back and and he really freaked out at that point and he went back to camp uh, we weren't that far from where we were camping. Uh, but we did have some Choctaw Indian drumming sessions there um, both nights before we went out. Um, apparently, it's 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 to let them know that we're we're here and that we want to communicate. We want to talk. And lastly, Sunday morning. Um, again, we all wake up around noon, and uh, one of the girls that was there as part of the group. The, well, there were two women there. There was an older woman, uh, Native American woman, and then there was this younger girl, and she had a rock hurled at her from way out in the woods, and it hit her in the knuckle, and it snapped her knuckle open, and it was bleeding. And she got hit by a, a rock while she was uh, uh, folding up her tent. 
And I didn't see the rock thrown, but I heard her scream. I was like 15 feet away from her. And she she described it. She saw the rock flying through the air, and it just whacked her right in the knuckle. And, uh, you know, pebble throwing and rock throwing is really common with having experiences. I know there's some guys down in, in South Western Missouri that were leaving out rocks and marking them with Sharpies and having them, the rocks disappear and having them thrown at them late at night. They were finding the rocks with the Sharpie marks on them, which I thought was a really clever way of collecting evidence. But this is what went on that weekend. And this was with people from Homeland Security driving federal vehicles and other like private vehicles. And uh, they, I'm absolutely convinced that Department of Interior with Homeland Security and other federal agencies, they're very aware that they're real. I see the biggest reason for the cover-up is probably the logging industry. In Southeast Oklahoma, there's quite a bit of logging that goes on. Uh, in fact, the one, uh, during the Humphreys incident, there was a witness who was a logger to what had gone on down there. He was driving a logging truck and had seen some of the stuff that went on as he drove through uh, down the road where all this happened. Um, I... I'm a firm believer, man. I just I've seen it firsthand and um, I see why the settlers, you know, before the term Bigfoot came came around, they called them Indian devils. They thought they were the spirits of Indians that had been killed in the area. There's uh, stories of colonialists that were in the area that were killed by Bigfoot creatures. Uh, there's theories that smallpox is what eradicated a lot of Bigfoot creatures from the area. Um, which is entirely possible. Um, it might explain why they're scared of people. They know that like contact with man equals death in a lot of different ways. So they they stay away. But on the metaphysical end of being able to like yell into people's heads and and become shadow figures or be blend in with the background, you think about it like cephalopods in the ocean, octopus, they all have these abilities. Uh, there's Sharks that swim right by octopus have no idea that they're there. They look just like a rock. And then when the shark is gone, the octopus turns back into another color and he's gone. And you wouldn't see him either. So that all, all of that is entirely possible. But I think, you know, it's, it, it, uh, it needs a lot more investigation, without a doubt, of what in the hell these things are and why is it that our government goes to great lengths to cover them up. Another story I'd heard was in El Paso County, Texas, where there was a what they considered a rogue Bigfoot that was killing livestock. And Department of Interior was involved. And I talked to a sheriff down there that was retired that was part of the investigation. And he had quite an earful to say about Department of Interior and their cover-up and the way they control. Uh, they use damage control and uh, controlled opposition disinformation methods of, you know, you didn't see that. That never happened, you know, telling them this, these kinds of things, gaslighting methods of uh, that report was never written, even though he, he just read it 30 minutes ago, you know, that kind of thing. And, and uh, what are we dealing with here? And especially what I would say most concerns me is the people that go missing in national parks and the – the, the the records of those people and the evidence around their disappearances are not public record is very disturbing. That really bothers me a lot. And I want to know what's going on there and why. We deserve to know if American people have access to national parks and the, our government knows about these entities, if they're involved in these disappearances, then uh, we we deserve to know. And uh, I think that's about it, man. That's all I've got. Okay, Dave. Well, I appreciate you sharing everything with me on the channel. I have yeah. some questions for you if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Just because this was a lot of information for me to take in all at once, what was your role with the government and why did they choose you to work with them? Um, I'm a defense contractor. Um, the, the guy with whole name security felt really comfortable with me coming down, uh, because I was really familiar with working with people in federal law enforcement and, uh, and in, in military. 
Uh, I was raised by a drill sergeant in Marine Corps. Um, I, I've lived it and seen it. I know, I know the types and I know the type of people. And I think he just felt comfortable talking with me. That was it. Okay. And you mentioned they use night vision. Do you believe the Bigfoot can see the infrared off the night vision? And do you know what type of night vision they used? I, I don't exactly. Um, that's a really good question. They're convinced that they can see the infrared that's used in classic digital cameras and they avoid it because they, they can see it coming. Like the infrared that's used in autofocus, um, they can see that clear as day. They believe that they can see that. Um, so they they told me right away that g going through there, uh, would there be absolutely no cameras? Don't use them. You're going to ruin our our experience if you have you know uh, modern digital cameras. I think the thing to do is if you want to try to capture photographs of them, is to use cameras from the 1960s and 70s that are just you know Polaroid you know roll type film like 810 or 35 millimeter or whatever with no flash. Use a archaic, uh, low-tech, uh, old-school vintage cameras. I think that's the way, if you're going to photograph them, that's the way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think you got hit by infrasound when you experienced the mind speak? I think that the creature truly has the ability to do this to to each to other entities and to human beings uh I, I i don't think i was a part of some bizarre ex government experiment or something weird like that um and i don't know what you mean by that but um i, I a lot of these terms i i'm not totally familiar with you know because i this is my only experience down there but when you talk, when you say infraspeak, is that what you mean by that? By like almost a telepathic projection speak into your head? Well, infrasound can be used by like tigers and elephants. Tigers can stun their prey when they use it. And it's theorized that mountain lions can use it as well. And that's kind of what I gathered when you were telling me about the mind speak incident is that maybe this thing hit you with some infrasound and somehow got in your head well okay um I, I think it definitely did because it was loud and inaudible it was it was audible to me in my head now i'm a uh a, i have a lot of experience in uh, scuba diving all over the world i've done commercial and recreational diving i'm a diving instructor i've been i've dove i have probably 800 dives worldwide in in probably 16 different countries and one of the phenomena I found fascinating was with sperm whales using infrasound on Humboldt squid. They can stun squid or cause them to be confused using low frequency waves from drums inside their heads. Um, it's actually part of their hunting process where they'll thump, they'll boom, they'll use a low frequency wave, stun the squid, and it becomes disoriented and kind of confused. And then the sperm whale will go and capture it and eat it so it can't swim away. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was referring to, that yeah. maybe these creatures have some type of ability to stun their prey. I think it's entirely possible. Oh, well, speaking of, uh, what, uh, speaking of prey, these guys are convinced that their primary source of food is, well, grubs, vegetation, berries, things like that, mulberries and deer meat and they believe that their hunting method is to have some creatures standing up in trees and they'll either bait or they'll drive the deer into the area where the creatures are up and in, up inside of trees high up 20 30 feet and they will fall and leave have their legs in like a scissor fashion and fall on the the body of the deer with scissor legs and break the deer's back and then twist its neck round and round as it as it crushes and falls on it because they find deer carcasses where the necks have been twisted round and round like two and three times the hind legs are gone and the liver's removed and the rest of the deer carcass is there they find these all the time in that area turkey hunters find them all the time yeah that's an interesting theory and 
that very well could be. Oh man, it makes a lot of sense. You know that how they would they're they're smart. They would drive the deer into the area where their their buddies are essentially in the trees, and they drop out of the trees and crush their backs. I mean, they wouldn't even see it coming. You know. Yeah, I agree. Deer are not that smart. Yeah, and I agree with what you mentioned earlier. How they have these natural abilities, like squid, cuttlefish, and people talk about how eels can produce so much electricity. I think the Sasquatch have some type of ability to hunt prey. Oh yeah. I think they've got a cloaking background capability. Um, absolutely not. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. And I, you know, you hear about, Ones that, you know, either at night or in clear daylight, they're ape-like looking. And then you you hear about these, you know, these glimmer creatures. They look like a blur. Um, that that could be a cloaking mechanism. Um, in, in one of the episodes of the Missing 411, The Hunted, there's a woman who says they saw a glimmer creature going from tree to tree um that might be one that is in a partial cloaking or maybe it's not doesn't have the ability to completely disappear but it it can kind of disappear uh i am convinced that they've been here longer than we have and uh you know the one thing that gets me is when you look at modern man what's the one place we don't do well in is the woods there's not much for us to eat there we have to cook and clean everything. We're subject to all kinds of bacterial infections and diseases and food poisoning. Uh, we get eaten alive by bugs. We we just don't fit in the woods. If we're from this terra firma planet as we know it, why is it that we don't we don't do well in the woods if we came from there? Yeah, that I agree. That always astounded me. Uh, like we just don't seem to fit in. But this creature seems to fit in really well in the woods. It's its home. Yeah, the we're woods are the aliens. Home. Yeah, there, there, and there comes back to an alien type concept of: were, Are we the aliens? Or is that why we don't fit in here too well? Were they here hundreds of thousands of years before we were, and now we're the, you know, we're the stranger, or we're the new guy on the block, you know? We don't fit in too well. Um, it, it's just uh, that's always astounded me and confounded me in a lot of ways that we just don't we just don't seem to fit in too well in the woods. We don't do well. Yeah, absolutely. We're the foreign invaders on this planet. It seems like. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that they would click their teeth together and communicate. Did you hear that when you were yeah. there? I might have. Um, there were some really strange sounds going on in the woods, but the best uh, chatter I heard was through the recordings they had made. Um, there was some really strange stuff where they would they would uh, put food out and microphones up in trees, and you could hear the 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 gibberish talk of like you know ooh-da, 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 like that, and then like click teeth clicking in between all of it. They had some astounding um, audio footage of of that stuff. And so much of it, you couldn't listen to all of it. I mean, they just had hours of it. They'd been out a lot at night, going on years before I ever met these people. Yeah, that is really interesting. Do you believe the animal expert would do owl calls to communicate with the Sasquatch? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what he was trying to do with the owl call. That mm-hmm. that is a some that's kind of a hey, how's it going? Apparently, with the with these creatures. Okay. And, and yeah. they know that it's not an owl. They know it's man, and they they hoot back and back and forth. Yeah, that's interesting. That's often what I do when I'm out in the woods to try to get some type of shock response by them. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would keep at it for sure. And I I think if I could go back, 
I would find, oh, uh, I would, uh, one of the people that were there said that one thing that draws them in is classical music, especially like Leo Kotke on guitar or like a concert uh, piano or a clarinet, like solo concert um, or orchestral type music. They're really curious about that stuff and it draws them in or any, uh, any uh, Indian drumming that you can do and blast really loud, uh, they, that will help draw them in. Things that they've heard over the past, you know, four or 500 years in that area, um, that, that uh, really gets their attention. Um, if I could go back, I would do that. I would set up camp and then blast acoustic music or guitar or, you know, um, uh, yeah, uh, Indian drumming sessions and, and see what happens, see if it draws them in. But that I've learned that you you don't go out in the woods looking for Bigfoot. You don't do that. You you set up camp and you go to clearings and you let them come to you. You give them the curiosity and then let them come to you. You know the idea of like these idiot TV shows like like Finding Bigfoot and Matt and Moneymaker and the rest of those clowns where they're running around the woods with flashlights going oh my god i think i saw something oh my god wait and then break to commercial it's all contrived i mean it's ridiculous what they're doing and that is not what you do i mean you couldn't find deer doing that you know what i mean i mean they're going to be gone by with you're within hundreds of yards with that insanity of flashlights and stomping through the woods and stuff who's going to stick around for that ridiculous yeah absolutely so do you think they were invisible when they were tearing up the woods or was it just too dark to see them no i i could i clearly know 100 percent that they had a cloaking ability going on at that time because this was happening before it was completely dark i watched tree branches snap and rocks get smashed and tree and other tree branches get flailed out of the way with absolutely nothing there. No visible animal or entity or or whatever going through the woods. Yeah, and I wasn't that, the only one that saw that. That is interesting. I've seen the trees get pushed over, and when I walk down there, there's nothing there. But I've also seen them move, and it's like burst speed. So it's hard for me to say. But that is interesting. Yeah. What parts of Oklahoma have you experienced this stuff? Well, I, I haven't been in the woods in Oklahoma. I just drive through when I'm going. When we used to go on family trips, we'd go through Oklahoma. Okay, so you mentioned that the Chakwa drums help the team communicate with the Sasquatch. Now, did you guys play recordings or did you actually get drums out there and start playing? No, they had a they had a group of people that were doing drumming uh, at sunset. They had their oh, wow. own uh, uh, Choctaw uh, chants and their and their songs, and they were doing drumming before we went out. Both oh wow, nights. that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, both nights. Okay, so what did the federal vehicles look like? Uh, Chevy trucks, black with red red and blue lights under the grills all blacked out no markings okay yep blacked out chevy trucks pickups four door open bed there were three of them yeah all right well i think that answers most of my questions i'm not gonna slam you too hard and you made this interview really easy so i appreciate that yeah, man, anything I can do to help, man, I want people to know. Uh, I think it's really important to get our experiences out there, and I appreciate you, you know, doing what you do online. And when I when I found you, that's why I contact you, contacted you to tell you, like, hey, man, I've seen it firsthand, and I've met people that clearly know about it and and have been doing it for a long time. And, and, I, and I'm absolutely convinced that the Department of Interior is totally aware of what goes on. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, I think so, too. And Oh, yeah. Dave, 
Dave, I really appreciate you getting in contact with me and sharing your encounters and experiences with all of us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's no problem. And Dave, you have a good night and it was really good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. So overall, Dave was a good guy and it was interesting hearing about the activity. I've heard people claim mind speak and invisibility from the Sasquatch. I did have a moment when I was younger. A friend and I were playing PlayStation 3 in his room and a woman said, Miguel, right in my ear. Also, at my friend Bill's place, we were doing research and I heard bipedal walking not 30 or 40 yards into the woods in the middle of the day. There was nothing there and I was looking as the sound was happening. Another time I saw a brown Sasquatch and it appeared like he just vanished like a ghost. The best way I can describe it is it looked like someone just threw up brown dust or sand into the air and the wind took it. I have heard the Native Americans make these claims as well, so we certainly need to be open-minded without a doubt. Overall, I wish he would have been willing to go more in depth and talk more about the group that he was working with. You get what you get, I guess, and it just leaves more questions than answers and more gaps than what there was in the beginning. Okay, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode and just go with your gut feeling. What are your senses telling you? I really want to thank the guest for coming on the show. And if you guys know what Sasquatch Chronicles episode he was on, leave a comment down below. Thank you, everyone, and stay warm out there. Thank <laughs> you.